Um, so I'm, I'm basically going to talk about very similar things as we did during the podcast a couple of uh, weeks ago. And that's uh, basically how I uh, come from a maybe not very uh, usual background of uh, particle physics research into game development and where I see differences and parallels uh, in the two somewhat different industries. Uh, and some of you might be surprised how many parallels there are. So let's jump right in. Um, here's just uh, what I've been doing and, and what I'm doing currently. Uh, right now I work in Tazia Studios, a small indie company in the south of Sweden, uh, where I'm a lead of, our, of one of our tech teams. Um, before that, uh, for five years, I did uh, particle physics research, uh, part of which was doing my PhD in that topic. And uh, after that, I joined Tazia as DevOps first. And then since a year or a year and a half, I now lead a team. So um, what just, am I going to talk about? Uh, as I said before, it's kind of my personal journey, uh, how I ended up from a, on first glance, very different topic uh, in game development and uh, what I perceive as being key differences or also parallels between the two. So first of all, so we are all kind of on the same page, I'm going to give a quick overview about what particle physics actually is and how it is to work in research and particularly the lab where I worked. Um, and then kind of try to elaborate or pick out a few examples of parallels and differences between the two. Um, and yeah, then also go into where I see some potential where one could learn from the other uh, or the other way around. Uh, before I jump in, I just want to give a quick disclaimer that everything I say here about the particle physics lab where I worked is just my own view and is no, in no way connected to the lab. Uh, yeah, all right. So let's start off with introducing Tazi Studios. Uh, we've been around for a couple of years now. Uh, we were founded in 2006. We currently have uh, 65 employees, and here's kind of a timeline of the different titles that we shipped. Um, and we, as you can see here, we had a long-standing uh, collaboration with Media Molecule on the Little Big Planet uh, franchise, where we first started out as kind of contractors for Media Molecule, and then did our own uh, version of the game with the PS Vita version. And then also we collaborated with them on on Tearaway Unfolded, and uh, yeah. Two years ago, we released our first uh, self-developed IP titles with uh, Static and Little Nightmares, uh, which actually were released in the same week. Uh, it was a pretty hectic week. <laughs> um, and yeah, we are based in, in the south of Sweden, uh, in Malmö, to be precise. And uh, we currently work on the second iteration of the Little Nightmares game. Uh, that has been announced at Gamescom earlier this year, and uh, I'm sure uh, there will be some people who have seen the trailer and uh, it's very excited, exciting to work on this next iteration of the title. Um, so that's about now. Uh, but so what, what, what about particle physics? Like, what, what is that actually? And uh, just to take that up front, it's not the same as uh, what you understand in video game. Uh, in video games are particle simulation or similar stuff. So what is it actually? Um, and this is going to be short. <laughs> Don't be afraid. But uh, essentially, what, what particle physics tries to answer are two questions. Uh, what is the nature of our universe and what, it is, what is it made of? And essentially for that, we, we look at uh, how matter is composed. And I'm sure most of you know from school that if you look closely at, at different kinds of matter, you see molecules. And then if you look a little bit closer, you see the different atoms in the molecule. And if you look even closer, you come to the nucleus uh, that's surrounded by electrons. Uh, and then if you look even closer, you find protons and neutrons. And uh, that's still not an elemental particle. The elemental particles are actually the particles that compose the proton and neutron called quarks. And those kind of particles is exactly what particle physics is all about. Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting interplay between theoretical physicists and experimental physicists where the theory kind of tries to explain and predict the behavior of these elemental particles. And then the experiment goes ahead and tries to either falsify or verify that theory. And also, of course, expose anything that was not predicted. 
Um, and the experiments that we do here, and, and I actually worked on experiments like this, uh, they, they range in sizes from something that you can fit in your pocket, uh, pocket, so kind of books or something like that, up to uh, things that are bigger uh, than buildings. So uh, it's, a, it's a wide variety of, of uh, technology that's being used to uh, do this kind of research. And then uh, a big part of experimental phys physics, experimental particle physics, excuse me, is the statistical analysis of essentially big data. So there's a lot of simulation, there's a lot of computing, and there's a lot of machine learning, all kind of terms that also uh, are probably familiar to anybody who's working on games. Um, and then let's talk very briefly about also the lab at which I worked, which is called CERN. It's uh, the European Particle Physics Lab. And it's actually the biggest particle physics lab in the world. Uh, it has 2,500 permanent employees and about 12,000 or so scientists that work with the data that comes out of uh, the experiments that are hosted by CERN. And these scientists come from over 70 countries. As you can see here on the left, it's split up in different kinds of uh, participation in CERN. But essentially, you see that all over the world, people are working uh, with the data or actually on the experiments uh, that are hosted by this uh, lab. And it's also home of the largest uh, physics experiment called the Large Hadron Collider, which some people maybe heard about in shows like The Big Bang Theory or something like that. Um, all right, so that's kind of all I want to say about particle physics. So most of you will probably now think, uh, okay, how is that related to game development? And for that, I want to first go ahead and explain to you how I worked back then when I was working uh, at these experiments. Uh, let me go back here just what to say, like on the right, you see a photo of actually the experiment I worked on. And you can see these guys in, in hard helmets there, just to give you an idea of how large these experiments actually are. Uh, and it's, it's overwhelming when you're there and see this uh, basically huge volume that is as big as a house packed full of uh, custom hardware that was just developed to do these kind of things. Um, but now, like, how, how did my everyday work kind of look like? I, I wasn't one of the people going down there with the hard helmets and, and actually installing hardware. Uh, I did a lot of programming in C++ and Python. And I maintained a build system. And I coordinated people who were working on different parts of the software that we were using. And kind of, uh, I do exactly the same stuff right now when I work on game development. And like, my tongue-in-cheek, uh, Kind of summary of this is like in the end it's all just kind of software development and i mean obviously that's a bit of an uh a bit of a statement given that you need very different kind of backgrounds for the two different subjects right you, you not anybody who can do software can maybe participate in particle physics experiments and not everybody who knows something about how software development can work in games but I want to explain to you where I think there is actually a large amount of overlap. So um, obviously, uh, when you think about it first, uh, or at least to me, that's obvious, the motivation and, and the challenges are quite different, right? Uh, one, one is about big data processing in physics, where you try to acquire and share knowledge. And the other one is about real-time applications that are essentially made for entertaining. But then if you think about entertainment, uh, to me, like good entertainment actually is something that challenges the status quo, that tries to educate people in various life experiences that were perceived by the developers of that entertainment. And they also try to criticize society or something like that, maybe. So in the end, it's kind of also acquiring knowledge for the players or sharing knowledge or experiences from the developer's point of view. And then if you uh, think about it, in the end, it's kind of just, you know, two very different approaches to similar stuff where you want to share your experiences with other people and try to change how uh, society works and things like that. Of course, that's not true for every game, but uh, there's definitely some overlap. And then the methods that we're using to do these different things are actually quite similar. Uh, you need optimized data representation and processing, like if you do real-time rendering or also when you do these big data analyses. 
Uh, you need highly parallel applications, uh, and that's basically physics simulation. And just as one example, like that's both valid for something that we need to do in uh, particle physics and also in game development. Physics simulation plays a big role. It's just different kinds of physics that we're trying to model here. And then machine learning algorithms, uh, they are slowly or quickly currently coming into game development where you know there's a lot of research being done on AI with deep learning uh, methods. You, I recently read a paper on, on physics simulation and, and trying to speed that up with machine learning algorithms uh, in, in games actually. And I mean, in the end, it all kind of tries, uh, boils down to trying to model uh, various kinds of complex systems and trying to take shortcuts through machine learning in doing so. And then, of course, uh, automation. Automation is kind of something that's that's everywhere and, and is being done as much as possible. And this is one of the examples here that I'm, I'm trying to pick out and elaborate on a little bit where, where the parallels are. Uh, because that's actually something that I worked on uh, specifically at CERN and also at Tasia to begin with. And at CERN, uh, the, the amount of automation is, is kind of very different depending on where you look. There's a huge IT department where, of course, all kinds of different workflows that are related to booting up a lot of virtual machines for all these different scientists that are trying to do their research are involved. So. Uh, there's a lot of uh, continuous integration and deployment uh, that's being done. But also when you look at the actual physics research and like, for example, data taking or the data analysis, uh, all these different methods are highly relevant. Continuous integration and testing is, is something that's super important when you collaborate with thousands of people on a code base uh, that tries to do uh, tries to verify various phenomena so you want to like have a good testing matrix where you where you know exactly what change in the code affects which analysis in what way and in tasia essentially uh the same stuff kind of applies right we have continuous integration and deployment when it comes to our build system uh, but also uh, we go a step further at, uh, where we also look at asset creation, level design tools, and, and trying to understand crashes. And that's just one example here on the right, where we use Slack, for example, to uh, immediately get a stack trace uh, to simplify fixing crashes uh, for our programmers when anybody on, on site kind of has a crash within the editor that we're using. And then testing, uh, as I said before, it, it plays a very important role uh, in, at CERN. And it's something that, that we're slowly uh, trying to adapt at Tazi as well. Uh, there's definitely some, some people in the games industry who, who do this much more than we do currently. Uh, like, for example, um, Rhea had some really great, great talks on how they used uh, test driven development on Sea of Thieves or like the blog posts by, by the guys who are doing Factorio are, are pretty cool. Uh, they, they do a lot of... Uh, continuous testing, and we're trying to get there slowly, but surely. And uh, so going from here, like what, what could we transfer uh, either from particle physics to game dev or to more specifically us at Tasia uh, or the other way around? Um, so let me just talk a little bit about tools and reusability. Uh, reusability of tools is basically something that's key anywhere, right? Especially for a small company like us, it's important that we keep using the same kind of asset pipelines. So, so everybody who's on the project and changes from one project to the other immediately knows how things work and, and we make the best of the time of the people that we have on these different kinds of projects. Build system is something that's completely uh, independent of the game development itself. So obviously that's something that should be reused everywhere uh, and anything that's connected to that as well. And then of course, infrastructure, like anything that's related to that should be as abstract as possible and have nothing to do with the actual project. Um, and then like, if you, if you look at what, what is being done at CERN, uh, the same kind of applies. We, we have these different collaborations with uh, thousands of people working on it. And how do we make sure that we don't waste a lot of effort on, on reinventing the wheel from, from one experiment to the next? And uh, the methods how this is solved is actually quite different, right? Within our company, it's of course very easy to share 
stuff across different projects, but in a community uh, of, of many, many people, uh, you need to think of different, different ways of doing this. And the way CERN is doing this is basically with open source. Uh, and that kind of brings me to the question, could there be more open source in games? Uh, so CERN basically is all about open data and open source. So essentially everything that is used for doing research, and this is not quite true, uh, there's, for example, some delay in the data that they are publishing, but essentially everything is accessible and it's accessible for free. Uh, likewise, all publications that are done on CERN data, they are completely free and accessible to anybody around the world. And uh, CERN really sees open source as a way to grow community, reach out to people and make sure to involve as many people as possible, right? Because you, you basically tap a potential of, of many, many people that otherwise wouldn't be able to contrib contribute in a kind of closed community. Uh, that can expose either problems in your code or that could have completely new ideas on how you could look at the data and, and can find stuff that you might have not thought of, thought of before. So it's a very interesting tool and it's a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, community that grows around this. In games, uh, this is being done a little bit less, at least that's how I perceive it right now. Uh, definitely like uh, Unreal Engine doing this step uh, of, of uh, being, being open sourced by, by Epic. Uh, that's a huge step, right? Uh, suddenly we have a, a very large code base available to anybody and per, per use by anybody. Uh, there's also some tools like Blender, for example, that are open source and, and great tools for creating games. Uh, and there's also more and more studios talking about open source, but uh, it's it's kind of, to me, it seems like this is not being done to the full potential that it actually has. Uh, for me, this is something where like the whole indie community could kind of come together and, and empower each other more and more by sharing all the different tools and all the different things that are being done that make uh, makes making games easier. Um, that is, of course, not to say that this is a trivial step, right? Like with Intasia, for example, we've been discussing this uh, over the last year or so, uh, what we could open source, how we could open source, what that actually means for stuff like uh, maintenance of the code, uh, support for people who are actually starting to use your stuff. Because especially as an indie studio where you don't have that many people maintaining your code, it can also come as a large burden when your tool actually gets adapted by a lot of people and the people come in with a mindset that you should fix the problems that they are seeing. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, open source, the, the point of open source is that you bring people together to contribute to the same tool um, instead of just one person or one, uh, one side, uh, one studio supporting that tool. And then, of course, you need to start thinking about stuff like licensing. And depending on the license you choose, you might end up in a situation where you don't want to end up where actually the things that you're creating with those tools need also to be uh, in some form free and open, uh, which, of course, becomes very tricky when you, when you start working together with publishers. Um, and then, you know, if you like one one example that you might think of is how, how could we uh, open up more different middleware uh, pieces? Like, for example, you have a library that solves inverse kinematics for you. How could we maybe open source that in some way? And there, uh, you also open up yourself to some... some um, uh, you, you might open up yourself to some trouble because, you know, how, how can you verify that everybody who worked on this uh, did their due diligence and made sure that any code that is within that tool is actually open and open source. Uh, so it's, it's definitely not a trivial problem. And I see why things are moving slowly or more slowly than, than some people might want. But I think there's a lot of opportunity here where... Uh, we, we can come together and work, uh, work together to make it easier to make the kind of games we want to play ourselves and make ourselves. Um, and lastly, um, let me talk a little bit about like, how I see the games industry uh, like, contributing to particle physics or how, where 
there's a lot of overlap or a lot of influence from the games industry into Arctic physics. And the first one, I guess, is kind of uh, uh, something that's that's true for any industry that that works uh, with computing or anything related to that, which is that anybody profits from the hardware progress that is mostly done because of the sheer market size of, of games, right? And um, that also ties into my second point, where uh, in data processing, uh, there are a lot of problems that are overlapping. So for example, um, a lot of the, the data analyses that are being done in particle physics uh, could, could uh, highly benefit from uh, being run on GPUs. So uh, that's where stuff like OpenCL comes into play. And uh, yeah, a lot of uh, learnings from the games industry can be actually transferred into research and, and help with uh, speeding up various processes that are being done there. And lastly, that's kind of something that I'm, I'm really passionate about, which is uh, how I think VR uh, and augmented reality as well can uh, be a huge impact on, on uh, things like outreach, education, and, and communication about these kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's like thinking about the opportunities. If you, if you could show to uh, young people how, give them a virtual tour of CERN essentially and show them these, these impressive large experiments that people are working on and, and, uh, give them an idea of how it is to work on these things, you know, that could bring so many people into research or motivate them to go into, into these uh, different paths of education. Uh, it could also, like, it, it could just bring people together to talk about these different things. And, and yeah, that to me just is, is an amazing uh, opportunity. And I mean, in, in the end, like, if you think about it, that's, essentially what games are about, right? Putting out there some sort of experience that in some way touches people and brings them uh, to, to think about things in a different way or, uh, yeah, brings them to take another step in, in, their, in their life and, and influence how they do their decisions, in my opinion. Uh, that's already the end of my uh, presentation, kind of. So... Uh, <laughs> I may have uh, convinced a few of you that uh, from particle physics to games is actually not as large a step as it might seem uh, at first glance. And that there are actually uh, a few parallels and opportunities where, where like one could learn from the other. So uh, yeah, let me close by uh, thanking everybody for listening. I was a little bit quicker than I anticipated. <laughs> Uh, but let me also quickly plug here that we're also looking for new people. So if you're in Sweden or you want to move to Sweden and are looking for an opportunity to work with us, uh, hit our website and feel free to contact us. Awesome. Well, Yashka, uh, I've always said this before. We've talked about two, three times now since the last recording. And if you can switch to your webcam, this is the Q&A portion. We'd love to kind of talk to you. You're an impressive guy having two, a dual career, which is no easy feat, but like two extreme uh, successes. Now working at Tarsia and, uh, you know, everyone's looking forward to your next game, Little Nightmares 2. Uh, being a physics scientist, uh, have a lot of weight when it comes to uh moving moving things around <laughs> i think uh I, I always have like little questions and as uh viewers out there are kind of pulling they were kind of discussing throughout i'll let them go ahead and remind them feel free to ask questions right now uh through twitch through facebook to twitter we have moderators out there and i will be taking a glance at them as we ask yashka your personal questions or professional questions um based off of your your uh, presentation here um, before we get into that, I have questions of my own. So uh, we, we briefly talked about during our, uh, uh, our podcast a few weeks ago, uh, the, the different type of reactions when you are talking about how um, you're going to game development, right? We have one side, uh, your physics scientist buddies, <laughs> and the other side, <laughs> you have game developer buddies. Uh, I have to also ask about, um, besides their reaction and their general feelings on that, uh, did you, were you pretty uh, much a part of the game development scene before you got into game development or is something you just applied and now you're surrounded by colleagues that you never really got 
used to, used to before? Um, I wasn't really exposed to it like actively in any kind. I, I didn't, for example, I always wanted to participate in, in stuff like game gems, for example, but I never dared to because I thought, ah, I'm not smart enough for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's kind of at the same time, uh, I was very interested in it. So I, I, I read a lot about it. I, I regularly visited Gamma Sutra, for example, and, and read about all these different postmortems. And then when people went to Kickstarter and, and through that, you could actually glimpse into uh, how game development actually works. That was kind of a, a big aha moment for me where uh, when I backed, um, what was it? I think Pillars of Eternity by Obsidian. Uh, when I backed that and I read on more and more about how they are making games and how are, they are making games that I was really passionate about as a kid, I love Baldur's Gate and these kinds of things. Uh, like that, that was to me like I need to somehow get into that and, and and try to be involved in this very interesting process because uh, that's also something I think I said on our live uh, uh, on the podcast. Uh, like it's to me one of the big things in game development that are just mind blowing and, and and really cool to me is how these different disciplines come together. Well, that's definitely also something that's happening at CERN. It's very much more or much wider in, in game development because here you have like you have artists, you have designers, and you have programmers that, that think about things very differently. While at CERN, you mostly have engineers and, and uh, researchers who, in the end, have very like mindsets. So that's definitely something that, that I enjoy a lot. Okay. Well, uh, I have a question here. And again, uh, to remind viewers, please ask questions through Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you prefer. But this is from Warmostees. Shout out to Ian out there. He's helping us moderate the Twitch chat. But the question is, what is the most surprising thing to you from your experience moving over to game dev from working in physics? Uh, Actually, how much I could apply from what I knew before. (laughs) Like as I said before, I, I when I when when I was thinking about doing doing game jams or you know trying or tried on my own to do these these little game experiments that I certainly tried over the different various years, uh, it was surprising to me. Like especially in the position that I took at Tazi in the beginning, where I was kind of responsible for automation in our build system, which I guess is also not the 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 most close thing to games, uh, how much actually was exactly the same between the two different jobs. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, my, my, my uh, phrase from the beginning comes in that in the end, it's, it's, it's just software development <laughs> while there's like, of course, with any branch of software development, there are specifics, uh, that are very, very different from one industry to the other, there are so many parallels and, and there is so much more that's shared between the different fields that uh, to me, it was surprising how, how easy it was to fit in and, and contribute from day one. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of, I think, the number one thing. And then uh, like on, on the opposite end of uh, like, negative surprises, if you want to call it, or <laughs> uh, it, it was also surprising to me how difficult it was for me to talk to people without a technical background. <laughs> there were so many situations where I, I tried to say something that I thought was completely clear to anybody in the room, and it turned out that I, I just was making noise and nobody understood me. So that was a big, uh, big change for me. Well, I mean, we talked about open source a few times and how uh, I agree with you. Like it's um, it's a welcome community to kind of share knowledge with each other, especially when our uh, financial well-being uh, it plays a big part of whether we continue creatively or not, especially with smaller teams where every ounce of effort is kind of put behind 
a project. And having multiple smaller teams work together makes a lot of sense. We talk about softwares, uh, especially within game development tools, uh, making a huge leap lately with Unreal and Unity kind of breaking that door open, Blender just chugging along and making such an impact just through endurance and now it's laughing at every uh, 3d packages out there um and and it's been uh kind of embrace with open arms um and we talked about a few and i wonder if you can kind of touch upon this a bit where game development uh communities can do more of this uh you mentioned in your talk about open source uh being an idea but also, um, uh, there were some conversations, some discussions. I'm kind of waiting more questions on this about how we used to have, at least when I was getting early in game development, and I'm sure you remember this, like I, I think Valve plays a big part as well, Dota, these kind of games that kind of came to be through a, a community where there was just a lot of passionate mm -hmm. artists and developers getting together to create a product that eventually became a huge product like counter-strike or something that actually got bought uh i will have to say aside from dota uh i don't remember too much of any community driven games in the last few years at least from the mod community that has made such an impact um i wonder uh if you can kind of give me your opinion on why this is and 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 the the state of game uh, developers in that mod community. That's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I've I've not thought about it this way actually. Like from from the modding community, uh, even though that's I guess kind of the logical next step from open source going to to modding, uh, or the other way around. But um, why is that? A very good question. I think uh, one of the reasons might be that just the amount of tools that are available from from the people who are making the games to to do that kind of stuff, they are maybe becoming smaller. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, with, with a Steam uh, Workshop, for example, there, there's still kind of this this push for having more community driven content and more com community driven games. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have no clue why uh, <laughs> why there isn't anything like really huge. Uh, while I, I would also argue that I guess some games definitely profit from from this drive in the community. Like for example, one thing that came to mind immediately when you started talking about this is Minecraft. We have uh, a lot of people making completely different kinds of or creating completely different uh, player experiences based on the game, like all the PvP scene is essentially, that's all community driven and has nothing to do with what the developers are making. Uh, I, I mean, that's of course false, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, I do have a question here from the audience. Uh, what has been the biggest lessons you've learned between working on your first game? Two Little Nightmares 2. I mean, you have quite the resume so far. <laughs> Winning is the, uh, the term of the day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what did I learn? Uh, like, I mean, to be, to be completely fair here, the first game I actually work on at Tazia is Little Nightmares 2, right? Uh, but one big lesson that, that we're learning as a studio and, and as a whole is, uh, first of all, like when you work with an engine, take the time that it needs to actually get acquainted with the different uh, idiotic idioms within that engine and the architecture within that engine to use it to the extent that you can uh, instead of basically giving up very early and saying, ah, I guess I have to redo this because I don't fully understand what we're, they were trying to do. Uh, so that, that was a big lesson for us. Uh, and then again, the reusability, uh, like designing things, having in mind that you may not just want to do one game, but probably want to do more. So while you while you write your code, while you develop your game, have in mind uh, at least a little bit, like what of the things that you're doing is something that you probably will have to either redo or extract from this game. And then designing stuff in a way that it's modular enough and flexible enough that you can actually easily extract it. 
Uh, that's something that we're doing more and more. And that's where my team actually comes in, which is like what we call our core tech team, uh, which is basically about writing systems that are reusable and, and uh, making sure that we don't lose a lot of effort uh, from one project to the next. And that's, of course, easier if you stay in the same franchise from, from Little Nightmares to Little Nightmares 2. But uh, yeah, there's definitely also some stuff from the other game that we made, Static, that we, that we think is very useful across franchises. Uh, I Not also reinvent reinventing so is very important. <laughs> well that's something that we talked about right this is kind of lending into the open source or sharing technology uh with smaller exactly. studios yeah. or smaller teams especially uh everyone is kind of like uh exhausted resources for one particular thing and when we're trying to just get the budget to make the one game we're not really uh road mapping uh the rest of the survival of the studio which is uh something that <laughs> makes makes sense when you're talking about your first project is like how do we endure uh because the best work is not usually the first project it's usually the second or third once the team is getting used to each other and which is uh i i at least in my own mind, uh, when I look at the data, right? Uh, not all, sci- not all I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, but I look at data as well. Uh, but when it comes to like AAA team, a lot of I, I feel like the, the the shutdown and the downfall in the last few years was because there's kind of like this revolving door with these studios where talent are kind of just. Uh, not respected and where like uh, the sequels are not as good and uh, they forget even though they have a a formula on paper uh, a lot of that uh, to make it successful revolves around the people who are uh, having the experience and uh, being able to go through the stress uh, and, and, and figure things out together not just by themselves but working together as a team and when you're trying to form a team and work on new projects and not have the same people it's you're you're kind of running into the same problems as well and i see this a lot with big and small teams it's kind of like the same idea um so i have a question absolutely true i have a question here and actually there's a tidbit i would like to share with everyone this is through the facebook chat from bro denard you, uh, we were asking about like what recent open source game uh, was kind of hit, and he kind of mentioned I drew a red box. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but uh, the story behind it is that a guy shared a prototype in on Twitter, and thousands of people replied giving suggestions, and he implemented most of them, basically becoming a game designed by the community. So this is uh, something. This is something that I've been trying to figure out because. Um, the, the, the traditional model of building a game, um, a product that you wait two, three years and you kind of just do this the whole time when it comes out. <laughs> uh, I feel like there's such a, a, a changing tide with the streaming and the uh, 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 people's ability to kind of share their progress throughout and kind of get that gut check every month if they really want to from the community. There's so many creative ways to kind of earn your income, uh, basically, when working on a project where you don't have to wait and pray at an end of a cycle. It's it's um, I haven't figured out a model yet, but I, I feel like there is either a studio in, in progress right now that's doing something like that, either through, I wouldn't say crowdfunding, but like coming up with a new system that other developers can look at and be like, that's something we can do as well. Uh, I think you being a guy who's always looking at, uh, you know, the industry, I mean, what was your opinion? Have you seen anything interesting uh, with that idea as of late that you felt like it's not quite fair, but I, I feel like we're approaching a, a successful studio one day that is going to uh, create uh, at least a, a guideline to sell games other than waiting three years. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, basically what you were saying, I, I think uh, like anything or most of the games that were crowdfunded throughout the, the, the year since like the, the first big ones on Kickstarter, uh, like to me, that was uh, eye-opening 
how they were, uh, some of them at least were, or the ones that I thought were, were doing the right thing, were interacting and engaging a lot with the community. Um, but also something that I saw is that it's a very tough balance to maintain because on the one hand, uh, when you listen to community, you get a lot of great ideas, you get a lot of good input, you get a lot of feedback about the stuff you're doing and uh, you can use that data to, uh, to make your game better. But at the same time, you have to be very careful to you know, not get distracted from what you're trying to achieve. And uh, I think anybody who has uh, talked to a room full of game designers or a room full of people who are passionate about a game uh, knows that there's nothing people love more than to project their own wishes onto something where you think the direction is very clear, but they uh, then take it and, and come up with these things that completely changes the the entire idea of the game so uh, yeah i don't i don't know i've not seen um like w one one project that i thought actually was was pulling this off very nice in the beginning was was stone hearth uh, which was a simulation game voxel based uh, where the developers were very open and they had all these different developer streams uh, that i thought were like you know that they were engaging with the community they were very open about problems, they were very open about uh, different tools that they're using, how they're doing their stuff. Uh, but in the end, they, they exactly this happened. They got distracted from, from uh, I th at least in my opinion, they, they got sort of distracted from uh, what the community projected onto what they were trying to do. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, they kind of uh, stopped the development, of, in my opinion, before they uh, completely finished what they set out to do from the beginning. For various reasons, yeah. Yeah, that the project was running too long, and people were uh, moving on to different projects and like all the kinds of things you were saying before. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's. Uh, I agree with you. It, it seems like we're on the cusp of, of of doing this in a new way that allows more people to contribute, but I've not seen anyone pulling it off in a way that I think is is truly using this potential uh, at its best. And that's maybe very pessimistic. Of me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I also agree with you there. I, I feel like we are on the cusp of this, with uh, especially with a lot of indie developers um, more than ever before, increasingly... Uh, well, the first word that comes to mind is crowd in the market, but that sounds negative. But it's true, right? It's super saturated now. Uh, everybody with an idea is able to kind of put out their product and uh, basically compete in the same space. But even though I don't think smaller developers actually compete. Um, I will want to ask you about this, like uh, companies like uh, Little Big Planet, those type of where they kind of it's like a like a tool within a game where they're allowing like huge communities uh, uh, work within their ecosystem to put out products out there within so their. Free. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've been kind of seeing where that audience of wanting to do things have kind of moved into like Minecraft is another popular one. Right. You might have heard of that, guys. Uh, but like, I, I feel like the, the, that's the the segment where where modders before used to uh, uh, kind of chaotically put things together through uh, uh, Valve's tool or or, or, or uh, any of the um, Zenimax tools. Um, are now kind of having more a control experimentation with these games put out there. Uh, like you mentioned Dream, right? Dream was uh, is probably the latest uh, from that same company that did Little Big Planet that has been just being able to do a lot of things uh, that would be difficult if you are not a programmer or a graphic artist. And uh, I wonder where the bridge is after that, um, because it feels like it's a great educational tool for people who are interested in game development, but there still needs to be like, all right, you know, time to learn Blender, <laughs> time to actually <laughs> equate it to something. Um, uh, have you kind of been paying attention to that, that type of community that's kind of been blossoming in all, all parts of the industry? 
Uh, that's actually, I can I can share a bit of a story there. Um, a lot of the designers who are currently working for us, they came out of the uh, community around Little uh, Little Big Planets. Uh, a lot of them, or not a lot of them, but a few of them were uh, basically putting out different things for Little Nightmares. And Tazia got a hold of them and asked them, "Hey, do you maybe want to work with us on the on the PS Vita game?" And they came and and basically made the game together with us. And now they work for us on on different games in Unreal Engine. So <laughs> I think there's definitely uh, like tools like that uh, definitely lower the threshold for uh, various people to to get into the industry and and. The courage that Media Molecule has with dreams, uh, like it's it's to me it's it's very uh, like it's just impressive what they what they produce there. Like it's uh, when I when I yeah it's it's an amazing tool that uh, just allows you to express your creativity. And if if you have that tool, making a game with a different tool, I feel like like once you have that, once you're hooked by doing that, I think. You you are so much more motivated to actually invest the time uh, that that you may otherwise not be willing to put in to learn the tools necessary to do the trade, right? So I, I think it's a very important ingredient to all of this, for sure. Uh, there's a question here, kind of lingering. So I think there was some confusion that. Uh, you worked at uh, CERN, but it wasn't CERN that was interested in game development. But uh, let me kind of ask this question anyways and put it out there. Uh, what does CERN, a particle physics uh, place, would be interested, as a hypothetical, would they ever be interested in game simulation of that sort? Uh, it's a, it's an interesting question, uh, and I think I said that on the podcast as well. There, there was definitely some people thinking about this um, in, in various various contexts. Uh, like one of them was actually what I mentioned. I, I think there is a huge potential if you if you think about virtual reality, which may not be strictly a game. Like if you if you do. Uh, if you create an experience that allows people to to see what's going on at CERN or uh, see these different machines, right? Uh, but it's it's to some extent uh, using the same tools for sure. Um, but then I think in, in outreach, uh, there's uh, and CERN actually has a, a kind of a group working on these kinds of things and tries to work interdisciplinary. Like for example, CERN invites artists to. Uh, to try and express what CERN does, and, and that's like part of the outreach. And I think they were also talking about whether there could be a collaboration with the games industry, uh, doing some sort of, uh, yeah, some some kind of experience that that introduces people to uh, what it is that CERN does and, and how it's relevant to people. Because it like to, you know, if you hear hear about this, yeah, we're trying to answer these two questions: what's what's the universe made of? And, uh, you know, it's it's like, yeah, how, how does that relate to my everyday life? Uh, but there's actually a lot of stuff coming out of uh, CERN that affects everyday life. For example, medical imaging. Uh, there's a lot of uh, basically cross fertilization from from CERN into other industries. And like, if you if you use these uh, various tools that games can give you to to bring these experiences and these these different uh, aspects to people. I think it, it has a huge potential to interest more people in this topic, as well as uh, you know, make it easier to uh, to to sell to people why it's important to do this stuff. Yeah, and I would like to ask too. When um, <laughs> it, it's it's great that it's been like what two years now that you've been in game development, and uh, it's it's always surprising to me when I, I talk to scientists. Uh, I don't know much, <laughs> but when I do, uh, it's always great to kind of hear outside influences from other industries uh, into our industry because I feel like in the last few years. And I, I mentioned this before, how uh, we were kind of like uh, 
and sort of like a, a pit hole with uh, with how studios. I don't know how how uh, entrenched you are with the game news, but like during the PS3 days, there was a lot of AAA studios just closing left and right, left, left and right, left and right, until Apple mm-hmm. really uh, released their phone uh, and, and kind of invigorated this indie modding community to encourage smaller teams to put out their games. And then we hear these stories about small teams making it big overnight. And then that's kind of spawned the steam green light stuff. And then in the last few years, Facebook having like this huge influence with Oculus buying them and, and keeping that VR community strong, uh, even though it's still trying to figure itself out, uh, it needs that type of money put behind it to really be full, uh, fully realized. Uh, otherwise, it would have been, I feel, another one of those. Yeah, I don't think as bad, but the Nintendo virtual reality glasses, right? It was a, like a good fad. <laughs> but because Facebook has this like <laughs> amount of money poured into the resources... That it has able to endure, uh, much like any independent developers uh, past their first project have to endure to get us to the quest, which is, I think, a huge step forward. And especially when they have that hand motion tracking without the controllers, uh, it, it makes it a lot easier for consumers to actually embrace it. Uh, and so going back to my original thought where you're coming from a different industry, a very serious industry, um, how do you keep seeing this type of, uh, the game industry evolving? Um, I I think a few guests before when I was talking, I feel like the game developers are losing control, uh, but that's kind of painting in a negative light. I, I think a lot of these industries are here to help, if anything. Um, and a lot of developers or professionals from outside the industry is, is finally coming in on the enterprise side uh, to kind of fully realize, you know, guys, there are a lot of things you can do here. You just have been business wise uh, going about it the wrong way. Let's not put our eggs in that basket all the time. We can we can do a lot of cool things. So my question is, yeah. what kind of cool things do you think will be coming? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> what year? Uh, well, I think it's it's uh, yeah. To to me, it's kind of a like as I, as I was trying to hint at at the talk. To me, uh, there's a like some people in the games industry, uh, definitely not all people in the games industry, kind of think that uh, it's a very special uh, and very isolated industry that nobody else can kind of grasp or, or like, contribute to. And I, I think uh, that's something that's being eroded more and more. And I think that's very healthy for the industry as a whole because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, be it different techniques to make the games more efficiently or... Uh, bringing in completely new big players, I think it's just healthy because it brings uh, new thoughts and new ways of, of doing these uh, experiences. Like uh, I think, obviously, Stadia is gonna be like to me at least that that's that's kind of the next big thing. Uh, how that will bring people who who are watching games and and the players closer even closer together than, than it's been so far right if you if you from a youtube stream can directly jump into into the game and play with your favorite streamer without even having to buy the game because you have the subscription or whatever like to me that that seems like a like a huge um yeah like a like a huge potential to bring even more people uh, even more players into the industry but at the same time, I think with, with Google, uh, there is a lot of brain power and a lot of uh, interesting stuff that they've been doing that you then suddenly have, have uh, access to through that platform, right? Uh, just imagine having, having uh, access to like even simple stuff like Google Maps from, from the platform you're hosting your game on and maybe being able to I don't know, bring bring certain geography into your game or and, and do something with procedural generation with that. I mean that that sounds amazing. And this to me 
uh, huge, yeah, huge potential to to do very interesting stuff. Same applies to to AI and machine learning, I guess. Like, I mean, they they have invested a lot in this, and if if you can harvest that to some extent in the experiences you're trying to create, I don't know. Uh, to me, that seems to be uh, could be a game changer. Yes, uh, this is speaking of game changer. Well, AI and machine learning is a huge part. And I, I feel like our industry uh, especially is going to contribute a lot to that type of thinking. I mean, anytime we're talking about real-time calculations, real-time simulation, we're essentially talking about game development in some sort of way, usually utilizing those tools to kind of kind of help with that. Um, I've joked, I think, with you before that uh, the Matrix is going to be made with Unity or Unreal. <laughs> Yeah. At, at some point. <laughs> um, but this is, I guess, an opinion of that because I'm always interested um, on that front. Like, how long do you really feel that um, we're, we're talking about the, the, the rise of robotics and automation within not just our industry, but every industry before? Uh, realistically, I, I'm sure you've done just some fun reading on the side as you know from being a scientist and a game developer uh, about this particular <laughs> particular topic i just want to know your thoughts it's like how, how far away are we from this because it feels pretty i feel like we have all the tools that we need to kind of get to this point where you know our uber driver is mostly automated and and all that stuff like how far away in our lifetime are we talking about 10 15 years where our world today is going to be looked at completely differently oh dear i i don't know <laughs> uh i mean i've, I've listened to uh different people talk about it for sure like for example i uh, i guess many people actually saw the the interview with elon musk uh, with joe rogan <laughs> where he like talked about this as well and I guess it depends very much on who you ask, right? Uh, like I, I, as a German, the Germans are very, very happy about regulations and, and doing everything the proper way and blah, blah, blah. So uh, like, uh, I guess it depends on how, how much regulation you put on this, right? How, how strict do you want to be uh, in a market that, or no, in, in, in an industry that potentially, or that has a huge potential of causing a lot of damage as well, right? And uh, I agree with Elon Musk on that, where he says uh, we are a little bit uh, not careful enough, <laughs> maybe, when it comes to AI development and, and uh, like deep learning and all these kinds of things. While at the moment it's you know it's very isolated, isolated little things that we do with this, which of course is not dangerous in any way, but. Uh, once you hit the, uh, the place where suddenly you have a human-like intelligence, uh, where's that going to lead? Like, if, if that happens, how do you go back from there? Can you go back? And, and all these kinds of things are, to me, also very interesting questions, right? Because it ties into ethics uh, suddenly, because you, you have an intelligence that is human-like. Uh, like, can you just unplug it? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, it's a very interesting topic for sure. Uh, but I'm also, I, I have to be honest here, I, I don't know much about it, right? It's just uh, casual keeping up with what's what's out there. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I know I can't, can't uh, pretend that I, I have enough information to give you any kind of timeline for sure. But um, it feels, I agree with you that it feels like it's it's not that far away. Like when you, when you listen to... Um, talks by by the guys at Google and, and how they then acquire drone uh, companies. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> seems, uh, seems all related to some extent. <laughs> yeah, uh, th and that's uh, that's why I keep always kind of approaching this question because it feels like what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, it feels related to that uh, type of conversations that's being had by like top, scientists top thinkers of the world um that is going to impact everybody uh that's connected to a computer right 
so this is a question from uh, Wormo Steez on Twitch. Uh, as you have moved to working on games instead of physics, do you feel like your work is as meaningful or more or less so? Do you feel like the work you do is as important? <laughs> Oh dear. yeah. Um, that I mean, it's it's a tough one. Uh, it's to some extent, yes. I, I definitely feel so because my my everyday work, like it affects as many people as it did back then, right? And I mean, I left also particle physics for a reason. I didn't go because I loved it. it there is a lot of stuff happening, in my opinion, in in, in particle physics that makes the work that you do there actually. F- you know, not very relevant, but somehow very driven by weird motivations. Like uh, there, there's a lot of political drive behind various things. And I don't know, it's, uh, it's, yeah. So the short answer is yes, I, I think so. But of course, um, you, I, I think I said this on the podcast, right? There, there's people uh, in, in research as well that uh, kind of, talked down to me when I said that I'm going to into games uh, development. And that's definitely something that also stuck with me a little bit. Uh, if somebody tells you, yeah, I mean, other people who worked here before, they go into something very meaningful where they work on, I don't know, cancer research or something like that. Uh, I mean, sure, what I'm doing is definitely not as relevant as the person who's going to solve cancer treatments. Uh, but <laughs> I mean, it, it, making these games and making these experiences definitely has its merit to me. Uh, and as I, as I try to allude to in my presentation, I think um, entertainment has this huge potential to, to influence a lot of people. And, and if you use that potential and influence them in the right way and, and maybe help bring society to be better, right? I mean, that's what, what at least I want to aspire to. I think that's a very valuable contribution still. Yeah. And, and of course you, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't find any meaning to it. So it's, it's a different type of outlook. Hopefully. I mean, <laughs> yeah, on a personal level, it's like, you gotta have to have fun, uh, with what you do and, uh, the impact that it can have on other people, either through entertainment or uh, among your colleagues to kind of advance a technology that hasn't been done before. And I think that's the draw, I think, for a lot of creatives, especially. Uh, It's not so much about, um, in a way, it is kind of like changing the world, but at the heart of it, with anyone in any industry, it's more like, uh, would this exist without me or not? And it's a question that I ask myself all the time, especially in a bigger um, studio. It's like, and I I don't know if you felt this at CERN. CERN sounds like a big place. It's like, am I just a cog (laughs) at some point, right? Can I just, uh, can I still contribute uh, in a meaningful way and and, kind of, shine some light on this particular uh, thing that I really want to talk about, right? And I, I feel like that gets lost in bigger companies, uh, especially if you're tasked out what to do. Uh, it sounds like certainly you guys have a lot of creative freedom on a individual basis that you're able to kind of maybe do research that you really want to do. But at, at the end of the day, like any place to ha- that has order, right? Uh, they kind of need to assign you things that you have to do and without either your opinion or not. And I feel like with smaller teams in the last few years, uh, being in the industry for over a decade now, I've been finding that voice of mine, um, even though it's to some people, it's like you're, you're making games, although I feel like the respect has been shifting where uh, it's a respectable job and everything now, or at least people are realizing it, uh, that um, that shift has helped me a lot, being able to kind of just have full control and being able to chart my own path. And I think anybody can relate to that, uh, most definitely. Well, uh, I agree. sorry, can you say it again? I completely agree, especially about the part with, uh, you know, if, if you're working at a huge place, uh, you're, you're essentially a small cog somewhere in a big machine. 
and and it doesn't feel like you're you're in charge of what you're doing or you don't have the the means to express what you really want to express or do what you really want to do. I definitely have much more of that where I'm working now, where where I get to drive certain decisions and, and yeah, do, do stuff that seems very important to our studio and, and shapes the future of the studio to some extent, which, which definitely is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that a lot. So there's a comment here from uh, John Smith uh, that he mentioned the CTO of Unreal Engine was from the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> but but I, I've been seeing that a lot, actually, just like prominent uh, technologists uh, from other industries are kind of moving to games. And I, if I were to take a step back, I feel like there is something happening behind the game industry that is compelling enough for these other people from other industries, such as yourself, uh, moving over. I mean... I think first and foremost, it's probably a little bit more fun, but also uh, <laughs> there's some meaningful impact there that's happening in all industries right now using game tools, uh, which is very exciting. <laughs> we, we are beyond the days of uh, pixels. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's very grand. Plus, the work environment is much nicer than CERN. Well, do you, do you mind? The studio looks so much nicer. <laughs> so I've been kind of blessed. Uh, and I think uh, people who are watching uh, are either watching from within a game studio or not. But can you kind of paint the differences there? I, I, I don't. The only job other than a game job that I've had is at Quiznos. And it's not really a, a fair comparison uh, in most people's office experience. Do you kind of mind not to paint CERN in a bad light or anything? I would imagine it's kind of similar to other industries where you kind of show up and, and leave. Uh, what are the key differences uh, just to end this uh, great hour of ours? Have a little fun with it. Uh, I mean, to, to, uh, to, to give you a, a quick understanding of how CERN looks like, you know, I... Before I went there for the first time, sometime during my studies, uh, before I actually started working there, uh, I had this picture in mind that that is was kind of uh, painted by by angels and demons and other literature that kind of mentions CERN. You know, I had this everything is modern architecture. Every there's a lot of glass. It's all super modern and super super awesome. And then I got there, and the first street you walk down is essentially a bunch of concrete blocks. And it's basically stuff put very quickly together just to make the experiments happen. And that's, that's what you see throughout. It's uh, form follows function for sure. You know, it's uh, the control rooms of the different experiments. They look impressive. They, they are packed full of technology, but uh, the buildings themselves are uh, sometimes in need of some, some love for sure. While at our office, I mean, there are people who actually think about, okay, where do we hang this picture and how do we make this uh, work environment feel nice? There's, I don't think many people at CERN who think that way. Yeah, uh, that is something that I think all game developers kind of take for granted that there's a somewhat of a design interior designer to kind of take a look through the halls and say, hey, let's motivate people as they walk to their desk. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, that is something that uh, often get overlooked. Like um, the, the the glamour and the the curiosity from most people that I talk to when I talk about game development or working in a game studio is exactly that. It's like, so you guys play games all the time. It's like, no, but we do play our own games a lot, like over and over uh, to the point where uh, it hurts us. But uh, I, I wanna thank you, Yashka, for joining us uh, to kick this off. Uh, it's been an enlightening talk and experience. And uh, well, thank you again, man. <laughs>